people are used to talk about HIE as a tool, and it's a powerful tool to influence a healthy public policy. But for me and for us at the NCC HPP, it's much more than a tool. It's a process uh, in which, um, yes, there, uh, you, you, you try to assess the potential impact of uh, policies developed outside of the health sector, the impact on the health of the population that will be uh, affected by this proposal policy. Uh, this is the core of the health impact assessment practice. HI is a process also where public health actors talked with people from outside of the health sector, with stakeholders, with decision makers, with citizens about their health and the determinants of health and why as public health actors we are interested in this policy or this policy proposal or this project which has not uh, health as the main objectives. And I think that HI is really um, give an opportunity to talk about determinants of health and sensibilize decision makers about the impact that they can have on the health of the population in their sector. <laughs>work with the uh, people assessing their health process is we would train local facilitators, people from the community. In order to ensure everybody from the community is involved, all the various sectors, you need to know the community. So you work with people within the community, you ask the questions, who's here, who's around the table, who's not around the table, who do we need to involve? And it requires a facilitation, but time to make sure that you have all of the various people. Because it's not always obvious when you first go into a community who are the different peoples or, or sectors that should be involved in this. So knowing the community would be important. and I were commissioned to conduct an HIA of housing improvements in Llangynor, one of the most deprived communities in Wales. It had to be conducted on behalf of the local municipal authority and involve local members of the community. Local politicians were concerned about the appalling condition of the housing in the area, but mindful that people just didn't want to be relocated. Knocking down people's homes, even if they are damp, cramped and noisy, isn't necessarily the answer. The people we met taught us how to engage with the community. Three residents represent the community and the steering group also included local housing officers, the community organising group we contacted in the first place, a health services representative and Welsh government officers for both health and housing. Although the residents on the committee publicised the HIA locally in language that local people would understand and they suggested places and times that we might be able to talk to people who might be difficult to reach otherwise, so they had the local intelligence. We were told that it was a be the best attended public, health, public meeting that they'd ever held in the area, so that was good. At the end of that uh, meeting, residents with local officials agreed to set up a tenants and residents organisation as a kind of a byproduct of the, the health impact assessment process. And that was something that local people had never wanted to do before. They were very re reluctant because of deep-seated mistrust. One very important issue, of course, in relation to health equity is power inequalities. Um, the, the, even the WHO report referred to them, but did not in any way unpack what they meant by power inequalities or what causes power inequalities or what needs to be done. And I think those of us who 
work in health inequalities are all well aware that every kind of inequality has power inequalities at the root of it. And that means really that we can look at all inequalities, whether health or gender or uh, physical ability or economic or racial, we can look at them all from the context of power imbalances. And that is something that needs to be done within health impact assessment. And in our report, we proposed methods for beginning to address that issue. But unless and until we take power inequality seriously, we won't fully be addressing uh, in health inequalities within HIA. I think health equity is absolutely central to the HIA process. For some people, values are less important than for other people, but the kind of HIA I teach and practice is absolutely centered around health equity. And I see HIA as very much uh, as a, a tool and a, a methodology for taking forward um, health equity and reducing health inequalities. So as I say, for me, it's absolutely central, both in terms of health inequalities featuring in the methodology at every stage of HIA, health inequalities can and should be taken into account. And also HIA should be an equitable process. So for example, in the way that we select members of the steering group, um, in the way that we uh, we approach the HIA, uh, it should be very participatory rather than uh, solely sort of technocratic. Um, in the way that we value, for example, lay people's evidence alongside that of experts, that they should be given equal value. And obviously that is about equity in, in the process. I think in, in equality and diversity impact assessment, what you're getting at, the, the physical mm -hmm. or um, in, in British legislation now they're described as protected characteristics, which I don't know what that means, <laughs> but it, you know, I think it boils down to the same point, which is, you know, is it gender or is it age or is it mm -hmm. ethnicity? And at least they're there and they're in a list mm -hmm. and you're supposed to think about them. Whereas the social determinants, it can be much more difficult and the biggest problem I think is the lack of consideration of um, income or socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. There's no legislation that says you must take into account you know, low income or poverty, yet that's most often the reason why people's health is poor. So, you know, that there's a sort of anomaly in that and the, the kind of um, statutorily required assessments don't actually suggest that you take action on those, whereas from a, a public health perspective, I think it's fundamental. Ideally, you would have one. You would have uh, HIA guidelines that are very equity focused, that uh, see that as a fundamental core. Um, but perhaps in the in the meantime, if that's not strong, maybe we we could develop some of these other tools. Although I'm pretty opposed to it, really, because I I just think then it becomes the the mainstream one becomes. Um, an unfair kind of framework and then everything else gets left to this other framework which often is only employed at the last minute or um, uh, when there's a crisis or when it's seen that that particular issue might particularly uh, impact on um, indigenous peoples uh, whereas in fact um, it, it, it's um, an issue that is there for them in every policy and in, in every issue. I think it's really important to make HIA work for Indigenous peoples, but ideally one wouldn't adapt a guide, but one would start from first principles. So what is the model of health that is used by that community, for example, and what are the kind of processes by which they work? Um, issues in my context in New Zealand, what are the constitutional arrangements that um, have bearing on the Indigenous peoples of that country? 
um, these are the sorts of considerations that should be, uh, I think, addressed. Um, and so starting from those, then you could draw on, I think, the guides, but not, in my view, adapt them as such. Fortunately, a couple years ago, we had an opportunity to participate in a research fellowship. Uh, and the main research question we were asking was, what do we know from the literature um, as practices that are promising in their potential to reduce health inequities at the local public health level? So we were really interested in having some tools, some best practices that we could apply uh, at the local level to help, help reduce the inequities that we were seeing. From that research, we uncovered 10 what we call the promising practices practices and one of those practices is equity focused health impact assessment. So we've taken those promising practices now and they really serve as the foundation uh, for much of the work that we do across of our, our organization. We found that gaining the partner support into that process to really get them to, to appreciate why it was a useful tool really hinged on, on a few different things and, and it was really helpful for us to have um, a tangible story that we could tell that illustrated uh, the impact of other sectors, that they that the impact that other sector policies and practices had on health. Um, we did that in a storytelling kind of way. We used also some really hard data to illustrate the inequities that existed within our communities and then kind of immediately followed those two pieces with uh, a presentation and providing more information about equity-focused health impact assessment as a tool that all members of our communities across sectors could use to help address those, those inequities that we were seeing. So we saw it as a really a multi-pronged multi approach to gaining that partner support, but it's really been effective for us. Um, and, and having that evidence base, knowing that this is a, an evidence-based practice to reduce inequities has really been helpful. I think it's important to stress that if you talk public health to people from another sector, very often they have no real idea what you're talking about. So when you talk health, people from, for instance, planning or economic affairs would think about doctors and hospitals and they would not understand the idea of the social determinants of health or other physical determinants of health. They would look at it from a very different view. So what you would need to do is to ensure that they understand what you're talking about. But on the other hand, Whilst you're doing that, you must also realize that their priorities might not be health at all. There will be other priorities and they are legitimate priorities. We tend to think everybody thinks health is the most important thing in life. But it is a bit of a surprise, not everybody thinks that, except for their personal health, of course. So the idea could be to not start from a health perspective and tell others that they need to look after health, but look at their perspective and take their priorities and start from there. So you don't think about what can they do to contribute to health, but what can the health sector do to contribute to the priorities of this other sector. So what you could do is look at where does this idea of dynamic city come from? It has very often to do with economic vitality, uh, less unemployment, more investors coming to the city, so making the city a more uh, attractive climate for investors. And if you look from that perspective and then you think, what could health do? You could think about proposals like revitalizing neighborhoods so that they, be, they look more dynamic, but are also more pleasant for people who live there. You could present images of people running and cycling in the street to illustrate the, the dynamic nature of the city and so forth and so on. And whilst doing that, you serve both the policy uh, in question, but you also serve health goals. De plus en plus, on s'aperçoit que les questions liées à la qualité de vie euh, sont euh, des questions qui préoccupent beaucoup, beaucoup les élus municipaux. On est des spécialistes à notre niveau euh, de nos communautés. 
Et dans le fond, on est aussi une contribution aux autres réseaux. Euh, donc, euh, le fait d'être en mesure de, de travailler ensemble puis de développer ces, 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 ces complicités-là euh, sur la base d'éléments qui touchent directement les gens, ben, mon point de vue, c'est ça peut pas, ça peut pas être négatif. Ça ne peut être que positif pour tout le monde. Là. Et donc, je suis profondément convaincu qu'à moyen terme, on verra que l'ensemble des partenaires auront contribué à améliorer les impacts des décisions sur la santé à chacun des niveaux, particulièrement au niveau local, qui est celui euh, qui est peut-être euh, euh, le plus euh, où l'impact est le plus rapide, si vous voulez. I really like working in integrated assessments rather than standalone HIAs. I think there's a lot of advantages to working together with other disciplines. Um, I think really there's a lot of information that can be passed between disciplines that's very important for us to know. A lot of times we're not very good at assessing economic impacts or social impacts or environmental impacts. What we really know is health. And it's very helpful to have members on the team who can be the experts in those areas. And what their outputs are become our inputs. And, and that's a real advantage. It's also an advantage to work together um, such that we're not going three and four times to the same communities, to the same set of stakeholders, and asking them as different groups what their concerns are. They get very burned out and very exhausted being asked these questions. So to come together as an integrated group um, really saves a lot of fatigue on the stakeholders. And then finally, I, I really uh, like the process of working with recommendations together as a group. If, if you're doing your recommendations separately, you run the risk of having one group's recommendation become another group's problem. And I can give you an example of this. Um, it, it wasn't our project, so I hope I get this right, but I believe it was a gold mine in Africa where one of the problems from an environmental side is that too much water was going to be created. And their solution was that they were going to create a large evaporation pond where all this extra water could be stored until it evaporated. From the health side, the problem that was created was Basically, you were creating a large malaria breeding ground from, uh, where all the mosquitoes could, could breed, and this would cause a health problem. If you're working separately, you may not know about these cross problems that you're creating. If you're working together in an integrated team, you have a much better chance of creating single solutions that work from all points of view. It's sometimes difficult to do an HIA uh, with, without all of the information that's already provided for you in an EIA. If I'd like to talk, for example, about the impacts of changes in air quality on, uh, on human health, I need to know how the air quality is going to change, and all of that information is found in the EIA. So we were able to really fairly easily integrate health into the framework of the EIA. The federal agencies felt that this helped them connect a little bit more closely with the interests of communities that are being affected by their decisions. So we found it to be very positive to, to introduce HIA as, as really just a, a component of the EIA process um, and, to, and to use that as a way to make sure that the community voice was being heard. Overall, I think we're, we're really, we find this a promising avenue not the only place that HIA can be done, but a place where there's a lot of benefit to the collaboration that can come up if, if you do a good job of trying to integrate the work of an HIA with the work of EIA. In strategic environmental impact, strategic environmental assessment, which is a European-wide directive, um, we've done some research in Scotland. My colleague Margaret Douglas has had a paper published about this, where we reviewed a whole series of strategic environmental assessments for their coverage of health issues, and they were pretty much um, all characterised by a failure to address differential impacts and really to understand why um, that distribution of impacts is so important to actually addressing some of the key issues.
I believe that many, if not most, of the HIAs that are currently being done throughout the world are done by people without a health background, which is quite surprising. Um, they're done by people, but well, anyone can do it. Anyone is actually able to say, oh yes, I'll do your health impact assessment. We have no certification, we have no standards that are agreed. So I'm hoping that we are working towards some kind of process of certification and standards, and also standards for training courses. What is a good training course? What is a bad training course? How do we ensure the standards? Because anybody can set up a training course. We've had discussions about whether certification in HIA makes sense, and I think it really depends on what stage of development HIA is in a particular area. So in, say, England or elsewhere in Europe, I think it may make sense to have certification where there's many years of experience. In the US, I think we are really too new to the process, and I think it would really be premature to have, limit HIA to people who could be certified because we're still all learning what the best way to do it and many people doing it are, are picking it up from, from multiple sources and it would really limit who could do it if we limited to just those who could be certified. I think it's important to realize that uh, we are very much a, a, a developing field um, and uh, hopefully we will get a lot better as we go on. There's no doubt that we can do better now than we could do 10 years ago uh, and by th continuing to think about uh, cause and magnitude of impact then we should get a lot better. Um, I mean I think it's worth emphasizing this business of magnitude of impact uh, because most of the HIAs which we deal with um, are very very poor on magnitude. Uh, they have great difficulty in saying anything much about it. Uh, and that, of course, means that when it comes to supporting decision makers, our comments are not of a great deal of help. Uh, they want to know not only that it's going to cause an ex some extra deaths, but they need to know whether that's one death in a hundred years uh, or a hundred deaths in one year. We've created an understanding of why health information is important and we've, we've um, developed the relationships to communicate that information. And one of the things that's happened is the need for formally doing health impact assessment of going through this very rig you know, rigorous process and systematic process um, has become has been become reduced. That because we can provide through the relationships, we can provide the uh, timely information, the appropriate amount of information at different stages in the policy process. When a policy agendas are being formed, um, when decisions, are, when policy is being designed, when policy is being decided, when policy is being implemented, these all call for different forms forms of information, but the relationships we develop through health impact assessment allow us to deliver that information efficiently. We, and, and the residual role for health impact assessment, where it's, it's, much, um, uh, where it's really valuable, um, sort of gets put, you know, uh, gets much more clearly defined, uh, yet information can be transmitted to influence decisions without health impact assessment. Keep going, I think, is the main thing. Um, I think the issue is that um, I think it's best you, you won't always achieve everything every time you sally forth. Um, but um, and sometimes you might find yourself in a situation where it's it's not as satisfactory as you would like. Um, and I think the approach, again, that we would take is best up, summed up by that um, a quote from Voltaire, which I always mess up, but I'll try, which is, um, le mieux est l'ennemi de la bien. The perfect is the enemy of the good. If you've got good, that's fine. Don't go for perfect. What are some of the characteristics and what's the, the motivation or the purpose that people are doing these HIAs for? And I think it's that point of purpose that's really a critical one to understand.
c'est comme un outil euh, opérationnel pour atteindre ces, ces grands objectifs de euh, la santé équité dans toutes les politiques. with all parts of an HIA process, you want the right people involved. You want the right people involved in the process and you want the right people involved with carrying out or facilitating the process. I just would really like to see more and more processes where people are asked and not told what they need to know. That would be my final message is ask the people because they have the knowledge. <laughs>